Hello everyone, and welcome to Translation Born, the show where we're taking a look at the translation of Bloodborne. We ended rather abruptly last time, so we're going to jump right in with a new item description. Monocular. Monocular used to view things up close. Not a hunter's tool, but a simple antique, to be used as one sees fit. So there are actually a few interesting things that you might want to know about this item, most of which are in relation to its name. These are the characters used in the Japanese version of the monocular item name. These can be read in two different ways, and depending on how you read them, the meaning changes. If you read them as Engankyo, which is what the characters are that are currently on the screen, then you're referring pretty specifically to a convex lens that's used to see things that are far away. If, on the other hand, you read them as to Megane, which is what's displayed on the screen right now, you get an old version of the Japanese word for telescope. This, for instance, is the first image search result that you'll get if you do a Google search for to Megane in Japanese. So it seems pretty clear that the game had this kind of meaning in mind. That having been said, let's go back to those original three characters and this time focus on the meanings. From left to right, these characters mean essentially far, eye, and lens, which really makes perfect sense here. But something to keep in mind about the Japanese language is that it handles plurals very differently than the way English does. In other words, just because those three characters happen to mean far eye lens, doesn't mean they're really limited to just one eye. And if you're looking for some evidence of this, you can find a perfect example in some of the other games in the Souls series. Games which are made by the same developer and in a similar style to Bloodborne. Specifically, what I'm referring to are the binoculars that you can find in Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3. Here's a picture of the binoculars from Dark Souls 3. I took it from a Japanese website that's made to help you beat the game. And if you take a look at those three characters right at the top, you'll see that they're the same characters used for the monocular in Bloodborne. Now obviously, if you have access to images, you can tell that one of those devices is clearly meant to be used with one eye, and the other is clearly meant to be used with two eyes. And I wanted to point that out as another example of why it's best to have as much context as possible, even visual context, when you're translating something. Really, this humble item, and the official English name that it has, I think stand as a great example of some of the intricacies that can go into translation that you might not even think about. In general, it's not an item that sees a lot of use. Its name seems pretty straightforward and simple on the face of it, and the description as a whole is fairly short. But if you dig a little bit deeper, there are some interesting things to be found there. Remember how I said earlier that to megane is an old word for telescopes in Japanese? Well, it turns out that monoculars, as an actual item, have a shared history with telescopes as well. And given the image that gets used in the game, as well as the rest of the context of Bloodborne, I feel like this is extremely fitting. It's just the kind of old, almost familiar technology that goes perfectly with Yarnum. Now, if you're curious as to what I've been doing on these inventory screens this whole time, it's that I've been going back and forth and comparing the item descriptions on the two different hunter sets that you can find in the game. And the only actual difference can be found in the chest piece, the hunter garb. And as you can see, the only difference is in the second line here. The version of the hunter garb that you find in the sewers says, accompanied with a short cape to wipe away blood, and the hunter garb that I just picked up here says, this one without the cape that wipes away blood. Other than that, the descriptions of the two sets are identical. But having explained that, I wanted to get back to the binocular for a little bit longer. Because as interesting as I think the historical and linguistic connection to telescopes is, there's a way in which I feel like the item name works even if you don't have that information. I know that personally, when I was playing through the game, I had never heard of a monocular before. I thought it was basically just a clever play on the word binoculars, except they only had one eye. But even with only that to go on, I feel like the association with the word monocle evokes a similar and perfectly appropriate atmosphere. Even if you don't know that monoculars have their own history stretching back to the 17th century, this item name can still work for you. So again, I feel like this item name is particularly fitting. Since I was just talking about the historical roots of the binocular though, and also because it'll be a little while before I get to the next thing I'd like to analyze, I thought this might be a good opportunity to talk about some of the different roles that research can play in translation. Of course, there's a certain extent to which this is just obvious. If you find something that you need to know more about, you should go and look it up. But there are limits to this. Some things require extensive background knowledge. 
This is why fields such as medical or legal translation require such expertise. And just as a brief aside, I think it's worth demonstrating just how much of its own language science writing can be. Here are the first couple sentences of an abstract in a recent scientific paper. Pseudon 2, P.S., isolated from the frog Pseudus paradoxa, exhibits potent antibacterial activity and cytotoxicity. To develop antimicrobial peptides with anti-inflammatory activity and low cytotoxicity, we designed PS analogs with Lis substitutions, resulting in elevated amphipathic alpha helical structure and cationicity. That was one of the more understandable examples I found, and even so, by the end, I couldn't tell you what that meant. But the larger point is that if you're not familiar with those kinds of terms, if you're not in that kind of scientific community, and you're like me and you read that sentence and it means nothing to you, then you really shouldn't be translating that kind of work. But obviously, not everything is going to be particularly far out of your ability to understand. There are a lot of things that amount to small details that you can easily look up. And this brings us back to the example of something like the monocular. I mentioned before that I'd never heard the term until I played this game, but if you showed me the picture and gave you the description and let me do some research to try and find an appropriate term for that in English, I'd probably come up with information on monoculars. And this is really where things have the potential to become very interesting. Because once you've done some research on something and you have a better understanding of its wider context, you can start to make deeper connections. And if you really try and use those connections, you can enrich the experience that players have of the game. And this gets at something that goes beyond just translation. I have a friend who's an aspiring screenwriter, and one of the ways that he puts this idea is that you want to achieve authenticity through specificity. So for instance, if you have a character in your TV show who really likes music, it's helpful to have them reference actual events and people and instruments in music history to help make that character more believable. Similarly, taking your time and doing research and looking into the tiny details of something can really add a lot to an experience. And, as I think Bloodborne and all of the other Souls games have shown, there's a certain subset of players who are going to be very interested in doing outside research to further their understanding of the game. And if there are clear external sources that a game is drawing upon, then as a translator it's especially important that you do the best that you can in order to understand all of that material. Because if you don't, that limits your ability to recreate that experience in the target language. So the more you can learn about every little thing that shows up in a game, the better prepared you are to do a good job at a translation. Of course, there are issues that can come up with this. The biggest one being time. If you're on a tight deadline, it can be really hard to stop and look up a bunch of information and then consider how it will impact your overall translation. Sometimes, though, you can run across certain connections or facts in the Japanese that just don't translate well. I once worked on a project, for instance, where one of the characters referenced a plant name that sounds exactly like an insult in Japanese. And of course that's something that's not going to be clear to a non-Japanese speaker. And this touches on something that's very common in translation or localization work. In order to recreate the experience that your typical Japanese player would have with the game, you need to change the reference or the pun or the joke or whatever it is so that a native English speaker will have a similar reaction. So in the example I just brought up a minute ago where there was a plant name that sounded like an insult in Japanese, I decided to try and find a plant name that would sound or could function as an insult in English. But really, I think this is a simple example of how some of these concepts I've been talking about can fit together. You take a look at the Japanese and find a joke that's based off of a funny plant name. And since the joke is the real point, you decide not to just do a literal translation of that plant name from Japanese to English. Then, to make the joke work, you have to go and research plants with funny names in English. But in order to find something as fitting as possible, you want to limit the search to things that might actually be found in the setting where the game is taking place. And in this particular case, I was lucky enough to find a term that fit those criteria. It turned out there was a plant commonly referred to as fat hen or lamb's quarters that grew in the region. So while I did get lucky, doing that research really played an integral role in my ultimate translation. Hopefully it also helped enrich people's experience of the game. But enough on topics and translation, let's get back to Bloodborne. Poison knife. A knife slathered in poison. This curved knife is as thin and sharp as a surgeon's blade, often used for self-defense by special doctors in the healing church. They say that hunters traditionally avoid the use of poison, likely because the poison is too slow to act in the heat of the hunt. 
So there are a couple interesting things I wanted to point out about this item. First, note the name. It's referred to as dokumesu. Doku means poison, by the way. But it's also called a nage naifu, or a throwing knife. And the reason I wanted to point out those two usages of the Japanese was to emphasize that the term could easily have been doku naifu instead of doku mesu. And both of those words have foreign origins. Mesu from Dutch and naifu from English. But in Japanese, mesu has the connotation of a surgical blade or a scalpel. In the English, this aspect of the item is touched on more clearly in the second line of the description, where it reads, This curved knife is as thin and sharp as a surgeon's blade. The term being translated there as surgeon's blade is once again, mesu. And while the English translation does consistently use the more general term knife for this item, that also does let them avoid calling this item two different things. As I noted earlier, the Japanese uses both the terms for a surgeon's knife and throwing knife. And the other thing I wanted to note about the translation was that I really like the use of the word slathered. The Japanese there is the term tappurito, which is indicative of something done to a great degree. These knives aren't just covered in poison, they're slathered with it. I love the use of such a visceral term to get across that idea. Now let's say hello. You! You're not from around here, are you? Well, an outsider who's come to join the hunt? What a pathetic idea. You what? What, you think I'm a beast? Well, maybe I think you're a beast. And step away from our car, Tom. Hey, I just wanted to talk. Ah, oh, enough of you. What, you think this is funny? Well, I certainly don't, so be gone with you. I'll have nothing to do with your beast stunts. You don't care that I'm protecting you? Oh, enough with you already. Come on, just go with you. So, that's all you have to say? Oh, enough with you already. Come on, just go with you. Another of Yarnum's many pleasant residents. Actually, I find this guy's delivery in most of his lines to be pretty funny, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, there were a couple things I wanted to note here. First, in this guy's initial set of dialogues, when he says, step away from my castle, the Japanese is literally step away from my house, or my home. That's pretty clearly a play on the idea that a man's home is his castle, and I think it's a nice touch. But the second thing I wanted to talk about involves a more prominent change to the guy's next set of dialogue. Once again, I'm going to read you a literal version while I have the official version up on the screen. You're so persistent. People like you are always full of malice. It's nothing to do with me. Get lost. Beasts? Hunts? I don't want to be involved with any of it. Now, the first and last of those lines may have different text, but they're actually pretty close. The opening line about us being persistent, for instance, is a feature of the Japanese language that doesn't translate well literally. To kind of give you an idea, it's sort of like you point out a negative quality in someone, hoping they'll stop being that way. One way to tell someone to shut up in Japanese, for instance, is simply to say the word for noisy. And I would argue that going from, you're so persistent, to, oh, enough of you, is actually a great way to get that idea across. So it's really the two lines in the middle that have the biggest changes. The idea that he insults your character and then doesn't want to be involved with you gets through just fine. But the insult does seem a bit stronger to me in Japanese. Enough about him for now, though. There's another door back here I'd like to knock on. Oh my, what a queer scent. But I'd take it over the stench of blood and beasts any day. What is it, then? I'm off during hunt, so if that's what you're here for, I'll leave you to your own devices. If that doesn't do it, come back in the morning, darling. <laughs> Well, that wasn't what I was expecting. Do you have anything else to say? I'm off during hunts. Come back in the morning, darling. <laughs> Alright, let me just check one more time for repeated dialogue. I'm off during hunts. <laughs> and that's our introduction to Ariana. Though I should note that if you come here playing a female character, you get a different set of dialogue. Anyway, for now I'm just going to focus on the lines that we just got. Once again, there's two main things I'd like to point out. First, there's the second line, the one that comes after she says, Oh my, what a queer scent. Literally, the next line of the Japanese would be something like, It's good though. I'm sick of the stench of beasts and blood and all that kind of thing. The official line is, But I'd take it over the stench of blood and beasts any day. And I think it does a great job concisely expressing those two thoughts at once and in a natural way. 
The second thing I wanted to point out was that the innuendo of I'll leave you to your own devices, if that doesn't do it, come back in the morning, darling, I think perfectly captures a similar innuendo in the Japanese. Now for this lore note. A watchman of Bergenworth guards the gate with a password, the sacred adage of the Grand Cathedral. A short note as you can see, but one I think it's worth spending a bit of time on. First, I think that the official translation here does a good job of smoothing out and clarifying some points of the Japanese. Here's a more literal version of that note. The password guard is a guard of Bergenworth. Only the aphorism of the Grand Cathedral will open that gate. And that's pretty confusing compared to A watchman of Bergenworth guards the gate with a password. The sacred adage of the Grand Cathedral. The official version makes it a lot more obvious who that guard is. It associates that guard with Bergenworth, just like in the original. And it also does a good job of giving you the idea that the password that you need is the sacred adage of the Grand Cathedral. Interestingly though, the more literal version does more strongly emphasize the importance of that adage. Only the aphorism of the Grand Cathedral will open that gate. And this brings me to my next point. You may have noticed that in the literal version I use the word aphorism, while in the official version they use the word adage. And I wanted to dwell for a little bit on that particular word choice. Because while aphorism and adage are extremely similar words, I feel like there's a slight difference there that is especially interesting in the context of Bloodborne. So let's start by taking a look at the original Japanese term. That word is keiku, and it's what's on the screen right now. Literally that first character means something like admonishment or command, and the second one pretty much means phrase. And that's pretty fitting for the definition of that word. Here's the translation of the formal definition that I found in my Daijisen Japanese Dictionary. A short, clever expression that astutely captures a truth, an aphorism. And the word I've translated as aphorism is literally a Japanese rendering of that same word, aphorism. This is why in my more literal version of the translation of that lore note, I went with the term aphorism as opposed to adage. So now let's take a closer look at the definition of aphorism. This time from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, an aphorism is either a concise statement of a principle, or a terse formulation of a truth or sentiment. And I should also note that it's important that it be memorably or laconically formulated. An example might be the saying, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now finally, let's look at the definition of an adage. Again from Merriam-Webster, it's a saying often in metaphorical form that typically embodies a common observation. The most common example I've found is, a penny saved is a penny earned. So, as you can see, these terms are all fairly similar. But here's the thing that I think is interesting about the use of the word adage in Bloodborne. An adage is an expression of wisdom that's been passed down over time. Since an aphorism is really just a clever expression of a truth or a principle, you could come up with one pretty much on the spot. An adage, though, is different. It needs time in order to take hold. And while we haven't come across that specific adage that the lore note was referring to in this playthrough so far, when we do, it's made very clear that it's something that's been passed down across time. Also, I feel like the word aphorism stands out a lot more than adage. So if the translation had stuck with the former term, it would have been harder to make that seem natural. And now that I'm done leveling up, I think this is the perfect time to pause and end the episode. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for me, I would love to hear them. Especially as I'm experimenting with a new audio setup right now. Either way though, so long for now, and I hope to see you again in the next episode of Translation Born. Thanks for watching everyone.